What is up squad? It is your squid, aka Jill Centauri, the anxious squid, coming at you with another one of your favourites. Uh, it's video number seven in the Storytime playlist, uh, a playlist consisting of Australian history stories that I find interesting and that I hope to entertain you with or at the very least inform you about. Uh, on, on this channel I do reaction videos just about as often as I do these history ones, uh, once a week or two. Uh, I'm focusing on the NFL at the moment in those reaction videos, so if this is the first time you've seen me or come across me on YouTube, have a poke around the channel and if you decide you like me, then hit that subscribe button uh, if you're keen on more. Don't go anywhere just yet though, because uh, you'll want to see the rest of this one before you go clicking away and off to do all of that. Uh, today we're talking about something I think is quite rare, which is a colonial era Australian hero. This video is about a man named uh, Bungaree or Bungaree, who was the first Australian person to travel completely around Australia uh, in a ship. Uh, Matthew Flinders' ship, the HMS Investigator, and obviously I'm aware that most Australians refer to Flinders as the first person to circumnavigate the, the country, uh, but given that Flinders was European and Bungaree was not, I like a, the ring that this has to it a lot better, and I'm going to run with it. Bungaree was a Karingai Aboriginal man, meaning uh, he was from a group of Aboriginal people that lived in the area we now refer to as Broken Bay in New South Wales which is near the Karingai National Park, which was named after the Aboriginal name for the place, obviously. That's around, um, actually, you know what? I'm not gonna show you where it is on that map. I'm gonna show you this map of the perceived Aboriginal borders instead, now I think about it. I reckon that'll paint a better picture for you guys, um, but it's worth pointing out right from the get-go that Aboriginal people didn't really have borders in the same sense as we know them uh, prior to colonization. Most of these borders are just rivers, generally speaking. Uh, and generally speaking, Australian, Indigenous Australians uh, were a very peaceful people with very little warfare. I can say that almost as fact, um, and, but I'm basing it on the comparative archaeological evidence that we have. And, and, and when I say we, I mean us as humans, obviously. Uh, and we've not found many weapons of war in Australia, historically. Uh, well, we have found tools, cooking utensils, stone structures, and, and, you know, other proof of sedentary life in ancient Australia, dating back at least 70,000 years. But, um, yeah, compare that to the swords and shields and maces and catapults, etc., found historically in Europe, and I believe it paints a picture of a far more peaceful people. Let me know your comments, uh, sorry, let me know your thoughts in the comments section below um, on that one. You guys know I love to chat about these things and, and, you know, I'm open to interpretation. Incidentally, we are talking about a landmass almost the size of Europe here. We wouldn't lump Roman history in with French history or German history or Russian history uh, while discussing that particular landmass or that part of the world. And it, it amazes me how often we do that thing, uh, that very thing with Aboriginal Australians' history. Truly, I think it, it, it plays into the myth of the hunter-gatherer that I touched on in my very first video. Um, I'll chuck some links that aren't mine uh, about that in the description if you haven't heard of it before. Back to Bungaree though, while keeping in mind uh, that manipulation was likely a, a, an alien concept to him. As I said, he was a Karingai Aboriginal man, which means he was right in the thick of it when the British uh, and the First Fleet arrived just around the corner from him in 1788. In 1790, he would move himself into the British colony and he would, uh, he would build a reputation for himself as one of the few people who could seamlessly travel or flow in between the communities, indigenous or otherwise. Uh, despite not having a common language themselves, uh, the other Aboriginal people who'd moved into the colony alongside him or with the same view as him, uh, they viewed him as a leader of sorts, preferring to raise issues with Bungaree and use him as a central figurehead within the British Navy, or at the very least as a conduit to it because of how well he got along with certain officers. Rather than going to those officers and, and seeking them out for themselves, the men would seek out Bungaree and then have him make their requests on their behalf. In 1798, Bungaree was approved to travel as an interpreter and as a guide on a ship called the HMS Reliance, which was going on a trip to Norfolk Island. 
a ship that just so happened to be carrying Matthew Flinders as a midshipman uh, and George Bass as the Doctor. I'll mention this ship again when it comes time, um, or when it comes time to talk about how I think Flinders and Bass were actually in love, but for now you're going to have to deal with that big old tease and focus on the video at hand. Uh, hit the subscribe button just down there to see that one when it comes out, probably a few weeks from now, or join Patreon to see the script a week prior, but yeah, anyway. Bungaree would form strong friendships with Bass and Flinders on the Reliance, and it could be argued, uh, and will be by me in this video and others, that, the, that this trip to Norfolk Island would shift the course of all of their lives quite dramatically. To say that Matthew Flinders was taken with Bungaree, uh, that would be an understatement. Bungaree would accompany Flinders on every voyage that Flinders deemed necessary, almost from that point forward during each of their respective careers. Uh, the journal entries of Flinders, as well as Bass, and on other uh, uh, sorry other voyages, Parker King's journals as well. Well, they indicate that Bungaree was a very well respected uh, man by all the sailors on the ship, uh, on all ships that he sailed on. Um, often, as the only dark-skinned person on board, Bungaree would volunteer himself for the role of intermediary whenever they were set upon by locals while in uncharted territory. Uh, I know the concept of being set upon doesn't really mix well with my uh, with my prior assessment of indigenous culture being non-violent from earlier in the video, but you really have to imagine yourself in the situation to to make sense of the logic uh, that I'm trying to make here. These are the same people who worked with whales for food from the shoreline uh, for centuries, you know. Personally, I reckon they thought that the white people or the white folks were exo exotic animals initially, not people, but I digress. Um, one evening in what we know as Morton Bay, or what the Aboriginals knew as Turbul, Bungaree found himself stripping down to be completely stuck as nude, uh, naked, in order to prevent an attack on Flinders' men. And it worked. Uh, this is pure speculation, but in my mind, that was Bungaree stripping down and exposing himself to say, look, we're people, I'm human like you, because he, he also had a language barrier, you know, despite the similar appearance. Upon seeing him, the Turbul ceased their attack, um, and, you know, not only did he get naked, but Bungaree presented them with a, a gift set of spears, as well as a spear-throwing device uh, that he showed them how to use at that point. Uh, the Turbul people allowed Flinders and their men to pass unharmed, uh, and from what we can gather, it was probably due to that reciprocal gift-giving. Uh, reciprocal gift giving is commonplace at the point of meeting between various indigenous peoples uh, across the globe. Uh, incidentally, it still is to this day, and that's that's one of the first things they teach you uh, when you start studying indigeneity or indigenous knowledge in a global context at a Western university. Low key, the amount of chocolate with the icky white stuff on it, or um, stale biscuits that I've eaten out of respect for folks as I enter their homes, uh, it would make you laugh. But my go-to gift, generally speaking, was uh, double choc Tim Tams, but I'll admit it's easier when you're the visitor and not having to buy something that might just sit at your door uh, and theoretically could be sitting there for weeks. But anyway, I'm getting off track again. Back in Morton Bay, it's incredibly likely that the Turbul people saw Bungaree as the leader of the expedition uh, and the white folks as his support staff. His prior knowledge of reciprocal gift giving, as, uh, as well as his obvious Aboriginal appearance, would, would lend them to believing so, I, at least I think anyway. In 1801, Matthew Flinders chose Bungaree to journey with him in the Investigator, uh, it, the first European ship to deliberately circumnavigate Australia. Uh, I say deliberately uh, because Abel Tasman was a European too uh, and he and his crew did it in the early 1600s long before Jimmy Cook had even done his drive-by of the east coast uh, of Australia. Tasman just never saw the mainland and hadn't realised he'd done a lap of it because he didn't know it was there. Um, but T Tasman floated about haphazardly in the Pacific uh, and he happened to go around, a a go around Australia in a circle. Flinders deliberately wanted to prove that it was a continent and that Australia was one huge landmass. It took them two years to achieve, but together, he, Bungaree and their crew did just that. There are countless recorded instances of Bungaree potentially saving the lives of all on board with, um, with dietary advice. Things like, I don't know what that berry is, champ. 
it would be best not to eat it. Um, or, or showing the men how to harvest abalone or abalone, a type of clam fish thing that tastes brilliant apparently when it's cooked right and tastes like shit when it's cooked wrong. Um, but yeah, near the end of his life, Bungaree was given land, ration, land rations and the, the treatment akin to a retired naval captain by the British Crown. He was considered pretty much equal to that of his longtime friend, Matthew Flinders. Um, and, you know, for mine, that was for the fact that Flinders could not have done what he did without Bungaree's help. Uh, he was described by more than one governor of New South Wales, Bungaree this is, as being a man of noble and honourable quality. He was described by Matthew Flinders as intelligent, kind and friendly to animals. Bungary was one of the very first people to be featured in a full-length oil painting in Australia, in the colony of New South Wales, and he was the very first person to be featured in or on a lithograph, which is a type of print or photo printed onto metal at the time. As of the time of writing this, in September of 2019, there are over 35 statues of Matthew Flinders in Australia. There are 150 towns, streets or buildings that we've named after him, and more. Um, all, all, all for work that he couldn't have done without our lad Bungaree, don't forget. But anyway, Australians have over 20 statues of Apollo, a made-up ancient Greek god, over 10 statues of William Shakespeare, and we line the streets outside our sporting stadiums with statues of our sporting heroes. There are three statues of the fucking cat that was on the investigator with Matthew Flinders and Bungaree, named Trim. The spot in Moreton Bay that Bungaree bravely stripped down and declared his humanity to the Turbal people in order to save the crew, that's called Flinders Skirmish. Flinders! Anyway, I consider it an absolute national disgrace that at the point of writing this, we have exactly zero statues dedicated to Bungaree in our country. Maybe it's the American in me focusing on the statues, but I'm determined to change that fact as soon as I can. I've emailed the councils from the areas I touched on in this video with this video to see what can be done, re some public funding, uh, to, to rebuild Bungaree's legacy, which I, I feel is deserving. Failing that, I reckon we should do it ourselves. A life-size bronze statue can cost anywhere between 60 to 100 grand, uh, so it'll be a GoFundMe project, I reckon. I don't have that kind of money. Uh, but, yeah. That's it for this video guys, uh, my Patreon members will have an option to pick between what the next story time video is going to be in a couple of days, maybe next week. I'm working on three or four different scripts. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this content, I've got another reaction video coming out in two or three days as well, so if this story time stuff isn't what you're here for, don't stress, I've got more coming of both. Um, yeah, if you could do me a favour and circumnavigate and then throw a spear at the subscribe button just down there uh, and join me on Patreon, buy some of my merch. I'll see you when I look at ya. You'll see me when I look at you. 